Welcome to Guided Worship for the weekend of July 12, 2020. I'm so glad that you're joining us here online today. Uh, all 144 campuses of Alive, or however many uh, are signed in, I'm just glad to be worshiping with you this way. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 today. It's page 814 in, in my Bible, so it's going to be right around between 800 and 1,000 in your Bible, maybe. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, so Matthew 13, the first book in the New Testament. Go ahead and find that page. And uh, today we're going to be looking at one of the parables that Jesus told to, to those uh, that he was teaching about the condition of the human heart and how he works to install the seeds of righteousness through the word, through the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, it's going to be a powerful and wonderful teaching time. And uh, so we're going to start with prayer here so that we're ready for that. And our prayer text today is Psalm 51, just from verses 7 to 12. And I picked this psalm uh, because of a hand-washing song. And maybe that doesn't make any sense to you, but uh, when I was younger and had younger children, you know, they, they, they quickly wash their hands, they just get them wet and then they're done. And so we taught them to sing a song while they were washing their hands, and uh, for a while it was row, row, row your boat, and if you sing that one two times, that's about how much time you need to wash your hands. And, and then we migrated from that into prayer time, uh, to say a prayer while you're doing that, and actually that's been effective for me uh, during this COVID-19 season, is it's another opportunity for me to pray. Uh, but recently, about the last two or three weeks, I've been praying, and, uh, 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 while I'm washing my hand, I've been singing a song, uh, an old song that I learned as, even as a little kid, uh, mostly going to 6 p.m. night church, and uh, it's from the Blue Psalter hymnal, so if you know it, maybe you'll know this, but it is, um, uh, Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole, I want thee forever to live in my soul, break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, whiter than snow, whiter than snow. And you know maybe how it goes from there. But I've found that to be kind of a joyful time. Uh, I wash my hands for a long time and, uh, and also sing one of the songs that I've known for 50 plus years. That song from Psalm 51 uh, is why we chose 51 for our prayer psalm today. Uh, it's a song of David um, after he was uh, confronted about the sin in his life, and he asked God to cleanse him. Listen to those words from chapter 51. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast your spirit from my presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Before we jump into the Word, let's pray. Join me. Lord, the heart is deceitful and wicked all the time. I can't trust it. Help me to unbundle from all the things that stick so easily to my heart things that so easily tangle me up. Help me instead to seek you with all my heart, to understand your words so that it may sink deep roots into my soul and produce life, a life lived for your glory. Holy Spirit, be our teacher and translator today. Transform each of us into the likeness of Christ and help us to listen, hear, and live in obedience to the word today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's jump right in. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be at verse 3. Matthew 13, verses 3 to 8, where Jesus tells the parable of the sower. You ready to jump in? Yes? Me too. The parable shows us four very different kinds of soil, each responding to the seed very differently. This is how the Word of God reads, verse 3b. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. The third kind, verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred sixty or 30 times what was sown. Matthew 13, 
This is a, an amazing parable. And, and let's note a couple things about it. Uh, first is that the seed fell equally on all the different kinds of soil. But look how each different soil responded to the seed that was planted. There was the hard path, and the thief stole the seed. There was the rocky, shallow soil that kept the roots from growing deep. There was the thicket of thorns that choked out everything that was planted. And finally, the good soil that had healthy plants that produced a large harvest. As we think about those four different kinds of soil, Jesus is helping us understand different kinds of hearts. You see, this parable is about the human heart that hears the gospel of Christ and at the very same time is also full of all sorts of other stuff, different conditions, different situations. Here's the truth, I think, is that the gospel never comes to us in a vacuum. There's always other things stuck to our hearts. The gospel never just hits us without anything else going on in our life. And, and so I, I just want to look at this whiteboard here a second. And, and here I've drawn a human heart. And I believe that the human heart is built to be sticky, to be attached to its, its creator and his creation. We're built to be relational, um, to, to not be alone. And to serve, uh, to serve someone in allegiance, like to have a master. We're built to worship and, and uh, to surrender ourselves and to submit to Almighty God. And like our Heavenly Father, we're built to create, to be creative and, and lead and implement a plan and be attached to our work. And we're also created to commit. To commit to someone else, to commit to another person or to stand in the gap for that person and defend that one. God made these things to fill the human heart. When we live into how God designed us to be, our heart is full of his purposes. But here's what happened. Sin entered God's creation and changed the human heart. And now we're attracted to other things, things that we think are more important than our creator or why he created us. And we replace these beautiful things with other things. Oh, we're, we're still relational, but we choose relationships that push God away. We still serve and worship, but we serve and worship other stuff like our own work or the works of our own hands. We still create and lead and take charge, but instead of building the kingdom of heaven, we control others to build our own kingdoms. And we commit to things that take God's place in our hearts. That's called idolatry. And now other things stick. All those things that move into our heart displace what God is doing. Remember, this parable is about our hearts. And every time something else comes in, into our hearts, it removes from us what God has designed. And now our hearts become full of other things. Even this last one where we're created to commit, and now we commit to other things. You know, as we look at the, humor, the human heart, we can remember what Jesus was teaching in the parable about our hearts. In every case, the gospel was present, but other things were getting in the way. Every time the seed of the word of God was planted, there was stealing and distracting and the choking out of what God is doing by his word and his spirit in the human heart. Listen close. Even when the gospel is present, there are other things that stick to our heart, which affects how we hear it and understand it and respond to it. And we're not the only ones. We're not the first ones. In Matthew 15, Jesus taught how human tradition can actually get in the way of the gospel taking root. In Hebrews 12, we're taught that there are sins that easily entangle and, and wrap around our feet so we trip and fall on our journey. And all the way back in Exodus 20, when the law was given, we were told to not have any idols. 
And these aren't just made of wood and stone. An idol is anything that becomes more important to us than God. Anything that takes his place and sticks to our heart. You know, maybe we should do a pop quiz real quick. Amongst yourselves, what would be, what would you say are the top six idols that stick to people like us today? Maybe share it out loud. Maybe at home, say a couple of words. What are the top six idols that we have in our culture today? As you share those things, uh, I read an article called Idol Worship Today. Uh, Jeffrey Poor wrote it on April 6th for a blog called Rethink Now. And he said these six things are common idols today. Our identity, money, entertainment, sex, comfort, and even our phones. I'm not sure what your top six list would be, but maybe if it's hard to get at that, here's a spiritual health test. Where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my money? Where do I get my joy? What's always on my mind? Not the Willie Nelson song, by the way. How you answer those questions might show you the most sticky things on your heart. Our goal is to not let anything, even good things, take the place of God in our life and not move out his purposes and for the reason that he created us to be in a relationship with him and to be a part of his kingdom. But because of sin, we're full of those other things. How do we get after not letting anything fill our hearts so that there's room for the purposes of God? Well, remember the constant in the parable. It was the seed that always fell on all the kinds of soil, on all kinds of hearts. The seed is the word of the message of the kingdom of heaven. And the scripture says that seed falls. Uh, That word is is a pretty amazing word. It means as the, as the, um, the farmer sows that seed, that seed takes flight to land in a very particular place. The seed of the word of God takes flight to fall into the heart of the human to accomplish the purposes of God. Here's the way Jesus explained that parable in Matthew 13, verse 18. Follow me there. It'll help us get real with the truth. It'll help us do it, to to not only hear the word, but to live it out. Listen to what the parable of the sower means, Jesus said. Verse 19, about the path. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, clue number one, The evil one comes and snatches it away, what was sown in their heart. That's the seed sown along the path, Jesus said. How I understand this is that it's not just enough to say the words of the gospel. It's not just enough to share what it is. I believe we also need to be in a relationship with those that we disciple so we can explain it, help them learn it, help them understand it. It's how Jesus did it. Remember after his resurrection on the road back to Emmaus, he walked with those two on the road and he explained to them all about who Jesus is from the scripture, just like he did with his disciples. He taught them from the word of God who he was. Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, he joined his journey, he climbed up in the wagon with him, he taught him about who Jesus is and then baptized him. It's how Peter preached at Pentecost. He taught the Jews in Jerusalem who Jesus was by explaining to them that he was the final sacrifice for our sin, that by his death we have life. Jesus is calling us to partner with the Holy Spirit so that we might teach others uh, so they can understand. We're told by Jesus that we're to teach them everything that he has taught us. Those were his words in the Great Commission. In 2 Timothy 2.22, we're told to entrust the gospel to those who are trustworthy, who will share it with someone else. Understanding is the key. Verse 20, the rocky places. Jesus said the seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at once and receives it with joy. That's good news. That's a good day. But since they don't have root, they only last a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Now, that's an amazing condition to not have root, shallow soil, but the trouble and persecution comes from trying to live into the word because of the word. You see, the gospel will change your life. It'll call you out. It'll call you up. It'll call you to a whole new way of living, and it's not always easy. 
when we have to change our lifestyles and our habits and our thoughts, uh, we can easily give up. And that's why we need to disciple others who can also easily give up. That's why faith communities are so important, like small groups and home worship groups that will become small groups and our men's and women's studies where we find teaching each other about the Word of God, uh, hold, holding each other accountable to live into God's will and encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. It's a ministry of encouragement. Just like God encouraged the prophets, the priests, the kings, and the leaders by saying, I am with you, and Jesus encouraged his disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit to be with them, we're called to encourage each other. Search that phrase on your Bible app. It, we're called to help those who are weak and struggling, to walk with them, be patient with them. For those who are weary and, and they want to give up, we're called to help carry their burden. And for those who are losing hope because they can't wait any longer for the return of the Lord, uh, we're called to remind them that Jesus is always with them and that we, his people, the church, are with them. They have a place to belong, a people to be a part of. Jesus said this about the thorns in verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Maybe this is a theme verse for COVID-19. Worries are literally anxieties and cares that divide our heart so we obsess about one thing. The deceit of wealth are those false things, the fake news that manipulate us away from our faith. When someone hears the word but is overwhelmed by the things of this life, it makes the word unfruitful. But Jesus says there's a different kind of heart a, heart, a heart that he's been working in by his spirit that receives the seed of the word of God differently. Verse 23, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. There's the key. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 100 or 60 or 30 times what was sown. To hear and understand, those are the key words to unbundle our hearts from all the other things that fill us up. The word to hear, you know this word, it's akuo, which is just like acoustic. It's the things that our ears actually hear. Spiritually, what it means is to hear the voice of God in a way that connects with the faith that he's already installed in our hearts. And when those things come together, there's understanding. And that's the second word. To understand is to synthesize the truth, to take all the little pieces, all the things of Scripture, and have that epiphany, that aha moment where you go, Oh, so that's what that is. To join all those ideas into an interlocking, holistic understanding which allows us to discern the preferred will of God. In the good heart, the seed of the gospel multiplies. And like a healthy plant, it just takes over. If, if you came to my house, you would see in, in some of the flower beds there are hostas that are just, they're so full you can't see any of the other plants that are there. And they're, they're starting to climb up and lean against the house and spill over, over the, um, uh, the, the boards there onto the sidewalk. They're just huge. They've taken over. And I think that for me is the image of what it means to have a healthy plant just move in and take over. And so I wonder, what does that look like in my heart? What weeds and worries need to be uprooted so that the truth of God's word can take root? And I think that's what the parable is about. That as all those things of the world, the worries and concerns, the deceit, the lack of understanding, as God by his spirit moves those things out, what takes place then is the purposes of God for which he created us to be relational and to serve and to be in worship of him only, to be a creator like he is, but to create and build in the kingdom of heaven and to commit, to commit to others, to serve, defend, and stand in the gap. We have to unbundle our hearts from the weeds and worries. Otherwise, we won't be able to understand or have knowledge and discernment. We need to make the word of God our primary source and compare the world to it not it to our world. We need to have deep roots so we won't give up when it's really, really hard to live out the will of God. And so spiritual practices are a part of what we do, and it takes a long time to change the heart of a human. 
But when we value the word and the way of God above everything else, we're on that journey of being transformed. We have to have God in first place in our lives as our only Lord and King. We have to engage what he is doing and cooperate with his spirit because that word in us also calls us to join that work, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And then, and then we start to experience that good soil where we hear and we understand and we go, that's what God means when he says that. And it begins to produce a multiplying crop, a harvest of righteousness and joy from the word of God that's alive in us. You see, this call in this parable is to a whole brand new kind of life. Pursuing God through his word, unbundled from distractions of all kinds so we can hear it and get it and then do it. It's a call to not be foolish. Ephesians 5, 17, don't be foolish, but understand what the preferred will of the Lord is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I used to read Patrick Morley in the devotions that he would write. He once wrote this, stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. Otherwise, our hearts are going to be stuck to the things that take us away from God and his word. I don't know about you, but I wonder what magnets on my heart have displaced the work of God in me. If you're worshiping um, at home online, check out the questions below. Let God help you move some magnets. Let's have a heart unbundled to be full of God and his purpose. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, I'm often distracted by the things that don't matter. I even obsess about them. Sometimes I'm so worried about things I can't even hear your voice above all the noise. I confess that I haven't worked as hard as I should, cooperating with your spirit on the work you're doing in my heart, and I sometimes prefer to nurture the sin in my life more than spending time with you. Please, God, remove those distractions. Help me focus. Help me understand your word so I can know you more, so I can understand the gospel and share it with others. Make my heart full of your purposes, your good, pleasing, and perfect will for me. Make my life overflowing with a huge harvest of righteousness and joy and service and love for others and deeply intimate worship and time alone with you. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Peace.